Welcome to Optimize Your Success. I am Jack Scott, the Chief Operations Officer at The Mentor Project, and I'm excited to introduce your host and a mentor at The Mentor Project, Dr. Ruth Godion. Dr. Godion is an expert in the field of high performers. Each week, she uses a live panel filled with high performers to discuss different topics while posing challenging questions to each of the panelists. You are able to hear from each of these panelists about their challenges. You will learn how they overcame these challenges so they could excel and reach high achievement within their life. This is a podcast you don't want to miss. We're excited you're here with us today. Welcome to Optimizing Your Success. You know what sentence in the English language I hate more than anything, more than absolutely anything. It drives me crazy. It's like nails on the blackboard to me. When I ask people why things are done a certain way, they tell me because we've always done it that way. Oh, oh. oh. (laughs) When I hear that, I go crazy. I go nuts because every time somebody says that, all I can think of is blockbuster. Every time someone says we've always done it that way, I think of all the people and organizations who refuse to pivot, refuse to look at things differently. And for those people who listen in every week, you know me, I'm not just about thinking outside of the box. I think we should throw away the box. (laughs) So we are really going to talk about that and do a deep dive into it because high achievers really do that quite often. They throw away the box. And we have our incredible high achieving panel this week with a special guest who is up at 2 a.m. his time. And we really are in for a treat today. So I am really excited. Everybody is going to introduce themselves. So you're going to hear why they are here. So thank you for joining us on today's show of Optimizing Your Success. I am your host with the mostest. Dr. Ruth Gautian, everyone knows I study extreme high achievers, and we bring them here so you can get their insights as well. So everyone, a very quick and short introduction so that we can really delve into this topic today. Dr. Allison Escalante. Hi, um, I'm uh, Allison Escalante, and I am on a mission to impact anxiety. we live in a culture of criticism and uh, and anxiety that's constantly telling us what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Um, and this is especially impactful in parents and also um, for professionals who are so bombarded by all the shoulds that they can be paralyzed and anxious and unable to perform. So mm-hmm. I came up with a technique to help with this and I presented it in a TEDx talk. I write about um, life in the world of anxiety for psychology today and the science of human performance for Forbes. I'm an adjunct professor of pediatrics at Rush University and a full-time practicing pediatrician. Well, there you go. And now you know why Allison is here (laughs) because of that long, long resume. And I'm telling you, everyone here has that. Dr. Bruce Wiley. Yes, hi. That amazing brick background. We always wonder what background Bruce will have for us. Yeah, you may wonder why I have a brick background behind me because it's always been that way. That's how it's done. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so I'm a I'm a professor. I'm a uh, writer, uh, journalist, uh, computational modeler, uh, public health person. I um, cover health and healthcare for Forbes, uh, and happy to be back on the show. Thank you for joining us, Jax. Jack Scott. Hey, everybody. So excited to be here. I love the show, Ruth. So Jack Scott, um, military background of 17 years, most of which within the special ops. Uh, Around 2015, I pivoted becoming an entrepreneur and business owner. And today I am a huge advocate within cybersecurity and individuals transitioning into the industry, currently writing a book about it. And I am the COO of The Mentor Project. So excited about this discussion and and our special guest. Exciting. And yes, for those who don't know, The Mentor Project is the group, the wonderful, amazing group where we are all volunteers and they are hosting us. And Jax, I always have to dig it out of you every single week. What's that big award you got? 
And Ruth, maybe one day I'll actually volunteer that information. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the Bronze Star, I received it in combat during uh, my second deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. That's an incredible, incredible thing that you got. And thank you for your service. And we are going to keep shining a light on that every week because they don't just hand those out. So thank you. Janice Lentz. Hi, and thank you for having me. I'm Janice Lentz. I'm CEO of Hearing Access and Innovations, and I'm on a mission to change the world for people with hearing loss. And like Ruth, I feel the same thing. That is one of my many pet peeves. It drives me absolutely crazy when people say that. Um, and also the lack of common sense in life drives me is another pet peeve. So I'm really excited by this book because I just had a com an email from someone that I was like, I can't actually believe somebody would put be that stupid and have a lack of common sense to put what they wrote in writing, but they do. But I am on a mission to change the world for people with hearing loss. And I've changed hearing access in subways, taxis, museums, theaters, and government agencies in New York City and around the country. I've worked with the National Park Service to write their um, guidelines on effective access. I've worked with Build-A-Bear to bring hearing aids to their bears as the first mainstream toy to have um, hearing aids. When you fly and you see captions on airplanes, I'm the person behind that. Um, and working with Delta on induction loops for people with hearing loss in airports, tracking global best practices. And basically everything I do is common sense. Um, so I advocate common sense all the time. So this is perfect for me. I'm also traveling the world to um, visit every country in the world. And I've been to 194 countries, territories, and unrecognized nations. I love that. And, you know, Janice, I was just today invited to give a talk next October in San Diego. And I am hoping we can travel again by then because I'm in New York. It was snowing yet again today. So 70 degrees by the water sounds absolutely amazing to me. So <laughs> Jenna Marie Tutalman, my friend and peer mentor for almost 25 years. Yes, 25 glorious years, I must say. Thank you for including me, Ruthie. I appreciate that. Always. Uh, and uh, honor you for uh, throwing away the box. You know, I love that. Uh, so I am uh, Jana Marie Tutalman. I'm the founder of the Crystal Clear Foundation, where I, uh, on a mission myself, to guide women leaders to get aligned perfectly with their core values, convictions, and guiding principles. I have found in my entrepreneurship when I retired after 38 years of higher education, where there wasn't a lot of common sense, uh, <laughs> I can now uh, operate with all the common sense I have working with people and helping them in this way. So um, I've found that a, a lot of women leaders are not in alignment with their core values, which is where they have uh, a lot of struggle. And so uh, that's my mission at this point. I love it. And Jen and I have written, and Bruce, I know you've done this too, many, many government, specifically NIH grants and other types of grants. And we are used to banging our head against the wall because things just don't fit in neatly into their perfect little tables because they weren't perfect for our uses. So we know the frustration. Now, the man who is up at 2 a.m. his time and has agreed to join us the amazing, the world branding expert and the author of one of my favorite books, The Ministry of Common Sense, How to Eliminate Bureaucratic Red Tape, Bad Excuses and Corporate BS. It's a great book. And maybe, maybe Debbie Heiser behind the scenes can put in the link to the Forbes article I recently wrote on this book. But Martin Lindstrom, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on your, your amazing show. Well, I'll tell you a different story. When I was 12 years of age, I loved Lego. So I decided to build my Lego land in the backyard of my mom and dad's garden. And the only problem was when I opened the gates to this amazing theme park, only two people showed up, my mom and my dad, which really was the lowest point of my career. So I decided to approach a local print office and persuaded them to sponsor me. And two days later, I had, in fact, 131 visitors visiting my Legoland. There was only one problem. 
visitor number 130 and visitor number 131 were the lawyers from Lego suing me. They said it was their brand. And I said, no, I bought the boxes myself. Um, so guess what? Like a really bad movie, uh, the owner of Lego hears about this story. Now, Lego is from Denmark. I'm Danish. So he goes into his car, he drives to my parents' house, and it's almost like God is visiting you for a moment here. Remember, 12 years old, the owner of Lego shows up like Billy Wong, the Chocolate Factory story here, right? And he offers me a job at Lego. So I was the youngest kid ever employed in the history of Lego at the age of 12. And um, why do I tell you this story? It's very simple because many years later, I asked the folks at Lego, why did you employ this young kid? And they said, well, because we wanted to employ the audience to see you know, their reaction because we lost contact with reality. And guess what? Common sense is all about losing touch with reality. So here we go some 40 years later, right? You're still doing it. You're still doing it. And I think, and I've read the book and the core of what you talk about is understanding the user and what they need, right? Which is a lot of what we teach in leadership development as well. And you have an interesting story about how you really learned about what users want. You want to tell everyone about all the beds you've slept in? <laughs> yeah, I you know it's a crazy. Everyone's place. looking at me like, "What is she talking about?" <laughs> I've been sleeping around a lot. I had to admit, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. But you know, I, I I got this crazy idea many years ago that I actually would like to move in with people and and spend time in their home to understand their their view of life. So. Over the last 15 years, I've been spending time in more than 3,000 consumers' homes, living in their homes, cooking with them, sleeping with them, um, partying with them across 88 different countries. And um, what it's meant for me is that I've seen and experienced an extraordinary worldview, right, from a new angle all the time. And this is what's so fascinating about this whole thing, Ruth, is that I actually, I'm very introvert, but as I started to spend more and more time and seeing the world from other people's point of view, I actually became more and more extrovert. So the good news is I actually do think you can actually turn extrovert, you're introvert if that's what you want to do. But I also realized another thing while doing this, and that was that we in the world are increasingly becoming much more self-centered and actually the point, a different point of view is just not built into our behavior anymore. Uh, so one of the things I realized when I started to write the Ministry of Common Sense was the unusual correlation between common sense and empathy. I mean, common sense consists of two words, and one of them is common, which means different points of view. And uh, empathy is all about placing yourself in the shoes of another person and seeing and feeling what that person is feeling and what we noticed is through all sorts of different studies, and one of them is University of Michigan, which did a study uh, among college students, 14,000 college students, showing that the degree of empathy has dropped some 48% over the last decade alone. Wow. And this is, you no know, one may not say, well, what the heck, that's just the nature of life, right? No, it's not. Because if you go back in history, and that's one of the things I started to explore when I did the research for this book, was that the reason why we exist as human beings, as a species on this planet, is because we actually are the only species having empathy. I mean, there's certain regions in our brain which have evolved more than any other species. We had the ability to put ourselves in the, in the footstep, I assume, of a polar bear and kind of predict what the polar bear would be doing. Well, here's the scary fact. We are now losing that very factor which made us become what we are. And so a lot of people ask me, why do we see common sense disappear as quick as it is? Well, there's a range of different reasons why, um, but one of them for sure is that we're losing uh, right now empathy. So I do think that empathy is at in its existential crisis at the moment. So for me, this is not just a fun book or a book which is needed. It probably is even more an issue which is fundamental for us right now. And I do think we're seeing that in DC, the 6th of January, we see that across the world where we just slowly are losing what we so much hold dear, right? 
So where do you see the, the biggest problems? What are some of the examples where you've actually seen that? I think the biggest example is really is everywhere. It, it's like you see the symptoms quite often and you don't really think about it. And I, Ruth, I, I, I promise you to tell a story and I will tell you the story about the remote control, right? Yes. This one when I, and don't tell it to anyone else, but I actually stole this one, right? So um, <laughs> this remote, this is me going to a hotel in Miami and I am, um, I wanted to watch television, right? So I grabbed this remote control, and this has three numerical keyboards, right? It has six arrows going up and down, and it has two on buttons. Not sure how that works. If you press the second one, it's extra super or natural or I don't know. Anyway, so I'm managing to switch on my television, and after some time, I want to switch it off, right? But it has two off buttons. And the first one, well, I click on the first one, and then... The light in the room dims in kind of a sexy, moody way, okay? And when I click the second one, the air conditioning system switches off. But, of course, the television is still running, right? So I end up climbing under the table, unplugging the, all the stuff from the wall pocket. And that's really my story, except something extraordinary is happening three months later by a pure coincidence. And you guys think I'm kidding? This is true, okay? So I'm sitting at a, at a play, on a plane on the way to JFK. And next to me, there's this guy, an engineer sitting next to me, and he's talking about this and that. And at some point in time, I'm saying, so where do you work? And he says, the name on this remote control, <laughs> this one here. And I'm saying, to him, it just goes out of my I said, what the heck went wrong with you guys? That's the first thing I'm saying to him. And this guy looks at me like a deer in the headlight. And he comes with this really elaborate you know, explanation that internally in the company, they have this problem. You see, this remote control is called real estate, right? And they had the TV department, and they had the Netflix department, and they had the TV department, and they have the recording department, and this and that department. And they're all fighting for this remote control and the real estate on it. So they come to this amazing conclusion, why don't we so and separate everything? Which kind of means that, why don't we put on three numerical keyboards and why don't we just put two off buttons instead of one and stuff like that? And he says, it was wonderful. They're all in a perfect agreement internally. And then I pause for a second. I look at him and I say, except one thing, I don't know how to switch on your television anymore. And he really don't get it. You can just see he don't really get it, right? It, but this is what I've learned. I learned that what happens is it's a little bit like a bridge. If you have a bridge and the there's a little crack on the side, it kind of indicates a much deeper foundational structural issue in the bridge. And the remote control is really that. In our society, we all experience a remote control. And this is what's so frustrating. I bet you, you guys like me, have experienced that you say to yourself, oh, yes, just me. I'm silly. Silly me. I don't get it anymore. I'm getting too old, right? Well, that's not right because it happens everywhere. It happens with the 16-digit password, right, which have to be two upper class, two lower, this five numbers, random numbers, and you can't even consider using the password you used last year. God forbid if you do that, the whole world crashes, right? So it, it's, it's sneaking into every corner of our lives. So you are Christian, Ruth. It's where do we see it? We see it as a consumer, we see it as a parent. We see it as a business leader. We see it as an employee. We see it everyone. And we blame ourselves every time. And we increasingly give up. And that's where I'm starting to say, stop it. Enough is enough. Yes. We are increasingly just getting too far on this one, right? I, you know, and it's true. When all of us were talking about it before the show, we cannot figure out how to turn on our television. It's really, and, and this is an intelligent group of people. And we are frustrating, which button is it that we press? And then Apple comes out with a remote that has three buttons on it. Yeah, yeah. How did yeah. that happen? How did, right? how did that happen? And, and how did it happen that recently when I was sitting on a plane and the announcement is something like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, we suspended all cabin service on the entire flight. And by the way, if you want to use the laboratories blocked in the front, they exclusively reserved for the cabin crew only. And then you kind of have to line up in a TSA-like line in front of the laboratories where you infuse this freshly brewed smell of toilet. 
mixed up with a nice aroma of COVID-19, right? And then once you take a seat, you start to get these landing forms with a whole new invention in entertainment, right? The old days you had the landing form, remember? Yes. Now it's a new version. It's called a contact tracing form. I don't think anyone is reading them. It, it's really boring reading. And the first question on this one is, have you been in close proximity with anyone over the last 12 hours you don't know? <laughs> and then you get her phone number and 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 a name, right? I mean, <laughs> what is, so increasingly COVID-19, which we all believe in, and we all believe in wearing masks, that's not the issue, but everything is used as a universal blanket excuse. So let's yes. just put in even more stupidity into our life, right? That's, that's what's so frustrating for me, right? I, I agree with you. And, and we have all of this craziness. And I remember when your book was coming out, there were all these videos that came out that, you know, there, there used to be a song. I don't remember if it was the 80s and 90s. That was things that make you go, hmm. Remember that? Things that make you go, hmm. Let me do. And after the video came out, it had all of these things that I was just go I, I just went hmm why do we do that why are zoom meetings exactly one hour why can't they yeah. be 45 minutes yeah. and, and, and how come minutes? we, and why we can't don't we finish early? anymore right we, 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 we the first thing we say to each other is you are mute <laughs> that's what? Not true <laughs> what? what is this all about right? that's so, so no. true so what are we going to do about it i mean alice uh janice has been trying to fix the remote situation for years and you know everyone we're having this private little chat here about how crazy all of this is what are we going to do about it? what are some of these things we can do when these things just don't make any sense what what do you have what can you teach us martin i can and I tell know you, it's 2 a.m <laughs> wait I, can, I just can add one thing the problem Absolutely. with why the remote is and it's fascinating what you just explained but on on the cac committee when I, so i was on the fcc's consumer advisory committee and at the time, I one of my projects was to fix this remote because I couldn't turn my television on without my children. And they did not. And my children thought I was really stupid. And especially my son was like, at the time, like, I don't know, nine years old. He could not understand why I couldn't turn on the television. But I had the remote from the television, the VCR, the DVR. And then, yes. I don't know, there was some, the CD player. And then the, there was so many things. I just wanted one remote. And the reason is because the people who design these things are people who are tech people. So by definition, they understand all this. They don't bring in people, as I say, like not to disparage moms, but the average person to say, here's a, here's a box, turn this on. Yes. And I found this even with my printer. I couldn't recently get the printer to work. It was so complicated. You had to download something before you even set up your printer because, but you, why would you download something before you even know what the printer is? Right. And, but there, yeah. and when I, it's all because these are tech people and they don't read the internet of what the problems are. At least on my printer, they didn't. He had no idea because of course I called the CEO, I emailed the CEO. And of course the guy who designed the issue contacted me he never read the internet. He never read the problems. They have no idea what the problems are. They're so removed from their customer. That's so true. And, you know, I remember when I was in college, I wrote about this once. I, I had the front door to my suite, my dorm that wouldn't close. And nothing was done and nothing was done. And I am a single woman in a dorm. I think my door should close, right? I didn't think that was too much to ask for. Well, as I started going door to door, I started collecting everyone's maintenance requests. And then I handed it to the head of housing. And I said, I really think that you should spend a weekend or one night in the dorms to see what it is that we are living through. And it's exactly going to what Martin was saying. Maybe that's why he's sleeping around so much in all, <laughs> these, <laughs> all why not? these places to understand what the user is actually going through and to really understand that. And one of the things that we teach in leadership development, before you ever come up with a product, a program or anything, you need to talk to the users. You must talk to the users. That is 101 in, in anything that we teach. So Martin, absolutely. All right. So we see all this craziness. We see these, these 
remotes that we want to throw across the room. And by the way, Janice, and to all of the kids who know how to operate remotes, if you can operate that remote, you can also operate the washing machine. It has fewer <laughs> buttons. And the dishwasher. It has fewer buttons than the remote. It has fewer buttons than your iPhone. But we see all of these crazy problems. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change the world a little bit so that we don't have to have this frustration? Well, I think it's, it's a very good question. And if I should be really fancy here for a second, let me just draw a little model here. And if anyone can just enlarge, enlarge my screen so you can see my little model here, then I'll just get back to, to, to what, what I believe we should do. If you look at my little screen now, if you can see that maybe it's too small for you guys right now, then you will see that you have students, student, and you have do and don't. And, and really what what the space we in general should look at is the space which I call student and don't. Re really, that's where you have to focus on. That's where things are going wrong. Now, you have to do an inventory check of what you do every day. And you basically have to say, what is it which customers are feeling is really, really frustrating? And you will notice a lot of things going on there. So let me just go back to a little model which you will have here on the screen right now. The these are essential question you should ask. If I, for example, ask if you're an outside in, so that means you're a customer, ask yourself which of your products, services or interactions would your customer like to improve or kill? That's the first question you should ask yourself. And then you should move on a little bit. You say the next one is what are the assumptions justifying the current approach? These are all the excuses. That's all the red tape you have in the organization which wow. are trying to justify why we do all this stuff. Now, here comes a really important thing, and this is very important, because we believe today that we are deeply rational. You guys, more than anyone else know, it's not the case. In fact, 85% at least of what we do every day is deeply irrational. So here comes the third and really important question. If we scrap this approach, whatever approach it is, and stop pretending people were rational, what would we change? Okay. And that's a mm. really important question because in our world today, we have a tendency to believe that customers are rational. They remember these bottoms and these icons and these passwords and whatever it is. And the last thing you have to ask yourself is having 90 days to succeed, which of your changes requires the least effort generating the biggest impact? And really, it's super simple exercise. So you basically just fill in the frustration in the beginning. You go through all the excuses and the red tape internally. You flip it on its head and look at it from an irrational point of view. You, and then you attach 90 days of interactions uh, or interventions on it. And as you do that with one little different, one little thing, just a tiny activity, you'll notice you'll actually end up with a profound impact in your organization. And I can give you a ton of examples, but Ruth, I'm going to pause you for a second because I feel I'm talking a little bit too much here. No, we are we are just we are just taking this all in. And I want everyone here, including Susie Katz, who just joined us, who is the world's best photographer I have ever seen, um, to join us. And she is in California today, I think. You're still in California, California right? right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so I think we have a little bit of a uh, echo. Am I the only one hearing the echo? No, you all hear it. Okay. So guys, what other questions do you have for Martin? I mean, I, I have a ton and I, I want to know what, if you guys have anything about common sense or your own, your own stories of common sense craziness or what to do about it. Go ahead, Janice. And remember, no raising hands. It's not third grade. How do you, how do you get people to recognize that what they just said is so irrational. Like I just had an email that I received that was so, I, like I, I actually wrote back to the person and I thought maybe they may want to reread their email because I couldn't believe what they put and I wanted to make sure before I took the next step that they read it because I couldn't believe somebody would actually put that in writing. How do you get somebody to recognize that they're not using common sense? Oh, I have Again. to jump in here. That yeah. the answer to that is not to try to get them to recognize that they're being irrational. Um, it's uh, all about the neurology of uh, safety perceptions. So you have to come alongside and make them feel safe. And I bet that dovetails perfectly with what Martin's going to say about empathy. 
Well, it's a very good point, and I agree with you. And, and let me just jump into an elevator for a second and see things slightly in a perspective. Um, so a cloud of ours is one of the largest uh, respiratory uh, disease companies in the world. And they approached me two years ago and they said, hey, we want to get closer to the patients. How do we do that? The first question I asked them was, of course, when did you last speak with a patient? Now, this company is 100 years old, and the answer was never. Okay, which is kind of <laughs> giving an indication of where we are right now. Anyway, we persuaded them to go into patients' homes. And I'll never forget it. I go into this home of a 28-year-old lady, a lovely lady. She's had uh, asthma her whole life. And uh, I have two executives with me from this company. And I asked her one of these slightly sensitive questions. I said to her, listen, how was it? How did it feel like to have asthma as a child? And she starts to cry. And she tells me this very touchy story about how she was teased in school. She had no friends. She was stitched for every party. It was actually pretty horrible. And I said to her, it's, it feels like you have your self-confidence coming back. What, what changed? And she pauses for a second. She brings out her handbag. And in the handbag, she pulls out a straw. And she said, this is my trick. And she says, basically, whenever I meet someone new today, I ask them to hold themselves for the nose and breathe through the straw for about a minute. And typically, people will immediately feel how I felt as a patient, how I feel as a patient. It's almost like we are swapping a sense of empathy. Mm. So I took that idea. I stole it. And I basically replicated the whole thing for the board of this company. I switched off the light. I have some speakers playing the sound of heavy breathing like this, <gasps> that type of very horrible sound. And then I installed the whole board with straws. And they're all breathing through the straw. And after 30 seconds, one executive, he spits out the story and said, this is ridiculous, Martin. No, no one can live like this. And I look him in the eyes and I'm saying to him, except one thing, this is how your patient feel every minute of the entire life. And if you could hear a penny drop on the floor, you would have heard that. And what happened was a sense of emotional transformation going on. Now, I think you're right. Of course, you need to give people a psychological safety, feeling comfortable about changing their point of view. But I actually do think you could go even further. If you feel what another person is feeling, which also is another dimension of empathy, suddenly you don't need to have a survey done with 2,000 people saying the same thing. In fact, it's much more convincing when you feel it yourself because you are kind of already bought into the argument because you're arguing with it yourself. And what happened in this company was that we actually established what's called an onboarding kit. So the way HR was employing new staff was through the lens of empathy. They went through the empathy course. We had R&D doing products differently. We had marketing doing things differently. And yes, I do know, Janice, this is along with the story, and you can't really do this whole exercise for people emailing you once, right? But what I'm saying here is that what I've learned over the years works the best is if you can put people in another position. And I'll give you one very simple um, and very profound insight on this, which is a very scary story, which I don't tell a lot to people. But as I'm doing my ethnographic visits across the world, from everything from Nigeria to Iceland to uh, Venezuela, Caracas, I was kidnapped in, in uh, Caracas. And it was a pretty you know, horrifying experience. I don't need to tell you. I was away for a week. And I was locked into a, a, a very dark room and I had three of my kidnappers keeping an eye on me. And what I'll never forget about this story was that after, I think, three days um, of conversation, I realized that this was probably the end of my life. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I better just learn and uh, understand their point of view. And I love talking with people. I've talked a lot with people around the world. So I had a pretty fascinating conversation with these kidnappers. And I understood and learned where they came from. And I have to be honest with you, I kind of almost like a Stockholm Syndrome started to feel sorry for them. After three days, one of the kidnappers, he threw me a bunch of keys. And he says, you're free to go. And I look at him and I'm saying, listen, I'm not ready to leave you guys. I, I want to hear your full story before I leave. And I continue sitting in the room for another 12 hours, 24 hours. And after the 24 hours, the kidnapper is looking at me and said, you know what would happen if you would have left the room 24 hours ago? I said, no, we would have shot you because we didn't know you were sincere. Now we know you are. Please leave. 
and I'm still in contact with one of the kidnappers. And this is a story about empathy. This is a story about putting yourself in the shoes of another person. And I fundamentally believe that can change the world. And I fundamentally believe that we're losing that enormous, important skill as a human species in our obsession with ourselves, with our social media stuff going on, with our instant gratification behavior, all that stuff was increasingly uh, in reinforcing our own personal point of view, but never taking into account there's other views in our world. So, so yes, I do in, feel empathy actually can change the world. And, and I, I hope this type of story gives you a sense of how perform, profound it really is in our lives, right? I'm not even sure how to respond to that, Martin. That, that, that is, that's unreal. That's unreal. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I think that's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And in the uh, a light of uh, empathy, uh, I have a tool that I use, which I taught to Ruthie quite some time ago, and I call it the stairway to your soul. And it's about when someone, no matter who they are, and you're mad at them, they're mad at you, it doesn't matter what the situation is. A lot of times it has to do with common sense, not necessarily being kidnapped, <laughs> but it would even work in that situation where you use, uh, I understand, I need, and I appreciate. So by saying, I understand you, blank, 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 whatever the situation is, the person feels heard and nobody is ever heard. No one ever feels that anybody understands their pain or their problem. They just don't feel heard. So as soon as you say, I understand that that's really difficult right now, the person immediately is a little shocked in their mind and their response is, oh, now they're, they feel heard. And then you say self-care, right? So don't get mad at the person, just self-care yourself and say, I need you to know, I need, you know, blank, 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 whatever that is. And then you say, I appreciate it if we can work together uh, to make this occur or happen, whatever it is, which is gratitude. So, you know, it's compassion and self-care and gratitude. And those three things together calm people down at such an immediate level. It has such impact because there's no reaction to those to those particular statements if you keep them to one sentence. And it's it's really beautiful. I'm, I'm really, um, wow, in awe of like how you held yourself in that spot during that time with all that empathy. It's really, really beautiful. Really it, beautiful. I, lo I, I love you. I love your, your letter. It, it, it's a beautiful way of doing things. If I should try to flip it upside down, I think it was Bill Burnback, which once uh, was quoted having a, a pocket, and in his pocket he always had a little piece of paper. And whenever he would have a dispute with a person, he would have a fight with a person, he would be in a, in a disagreement with a person, he would always pull up this piece of letter and read the four words on it. And the four words was, what if he was right? Um, and I, I, I do think in our world today, we do not even allow those four words to resonate because we're so busy projecting our opinion on other people's. And I don't yeah. need to tell you the political situation we've been in and which is a, a bit of a nightmare, but also a lot of other aspects in our lives means that I don't care about what other people feel. And I think what happens is in organizations, we increasingly start to drink of our own Kool-Aid. And one of you guys said just early on that um, when you are a small startup company, you actually do have a strength. You are you're seeing the world from outside in. You actually have an entrepreneurial spirit. And the entrepreneurial spirit is, is represented by one fact that you have empathy. And let me just give you an example. For example, there was two um two young kids who were smoking weeds at in the door door rooms, right? Off their heads, one guy is shooting a photo of them, uploading it on social media, the hell breaks loose, mom and dad is furious, and the kid is saying to his Friend the day after, I wish we could retract the photo. And guess what? That's the story of how Snapchat was invented, a $50 billion company. It was invented by a very simple thing, which were empathy, seeing the world from outside in, and actually feeling pain yourself. And that then helped them to recruit other people, which were like-minded souls. It became a movement, and it became a company. 
But as a company grow older, what happens is we're so petrified of losing the power we have. So we employ lawyers, people from compliance. There's a revolving door staff going in and out. So that empathy feeling is gone. The founders are, are out. It's think about Google. And suddenly we have a company with a drinking of its own Kool-Aid, believing that the world is looking one way, but actually it's just slowly drifted away from the original feeling it once had. And I do think increasingly that's what we're seeing happening in our world, that companies are completely detached from reality, believing that they are right. And in fact, because the world has never been this fast and will never be this slow again, that we actually are quicker and quicker drifting away from what the consumer mindset is and what they really want, right? Absolutely. And, you know, Jen is a compassion sandwich, as she taught it uh, to me. I still have the printout on my bulletin board that she sent me so many years ago. Because what some people don't know is we worked, we were competitors, but we were all in the same industry. So we were on some joint committees together. And these were joint committees that were very, very set in their ways. Very set in their ways. I mean, they had such rigid squares and they would not let any anything permeate through it. And we were literally... Janet would have to hold me back sometimes because I thought I was going to lose my mind about why a change that should take five minutes took five weeks, right? Why does why do we need 25 people to approve these things? And I agree that compassion sandwich certainly works a lot. Now, I want to talk to Bruce and Allison because I think in medicine, you guys see this quite a bit of you guys have it easy right? When I was an intern, we had to, you know, walk in the snow without shoes and work 48 hours straight. Therefore, you should do it too, right? But that's changed, hasn't it? Not really. That's not what my students tell me. <laughs> uh, my students tell me that for the most, because, um, you know, it's funny. I just want to go back to something that was said earlier because I love techniques like Jana's um, sandwich or um, and so forth. But when I'm under, when I, I don't enjoy conflict, so when that's starting to erupt, um, I can never remember those techniques. And so what I've learned to do is just simply say, and usually this would come up in a situation where I'm the doctor and I'm with a patient, but I would typically then say at that time, okay, it seems like I'm not hearing something. Let me just mm -hmm. stop and listen. And that's it. That's what I do. And then I just let them talk. And um, that is usually when we then find that place. Right. And, and sometimes it's acknowledging agreeing to disagree. Like I say to parents all the time, I honor the fact that we have the same goal, right? Our goal is to protect your child or make sure they stay healthy. We might sometimes disagree about how to do that goal. I think they should have the flu shot. You disagree. <laughs> but, um, but I really respect that we are both trying to accomplish the same thing here. Um, so those are some things. Um, in terms of um, the fact that uh, the medical training um, really involves a certain sort of institutionalized bullying, um, that has not changed as much as we would hope. My students tell me that it's mostly lip service. Um, it's the sort of thing that started when I was in residency where we'd get <laughs> we'd have like a morning report for an hour on um, the damage uh, that sleep loss was doing to us and how it was going to make us die younger, et cetera. And um, we should therefore find a way to sleep more. But we were working 90 plus hours a week and there was literally no way to do that. So that was always fascinating. And apparently the students are still getting wellness modules. Um, yeah. So this is what we do, right? And so I'm going to stop here, but this is what we're doing about burnout. And this is a common sense thing, right? In all these institutions and in medicine, uh, we know that probably about two thirds of the problem is institutional factors, like the ridiculous design of my electronic medical record that is written by techies that is completely unusable by a human. And, um, but we don't change any of those factors. We do wellness modules. Yeah, modules are the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bruce? 
Yeah, I actually think that uh, some things are worse for um, current medical students. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're in a situation where like things are a lot more corporatized and um, they have a lot less con- uh, less control over their futures and what they want to do and things like that. So, yeah, I don't agree with the folks that say that, you know, it's always easier for the next generation, et cetera. Um, the other thing, uh, Martin, I also want to ask you about is, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk or mantras that actually go counter to like empathy, uh, like, uh, you know, um, win at all costs or, you know, uh, there, there are winners and losers or, or finding ways to, to blame people for things. So it seems like there's a lot of these mantras out there uh, that they're actually going opposite. In fact, I was told, um, I was, I've been quoted by some people saying, you know, it's the Steve Jobs quote, like, oh, uh, sometimes the customer doesn't even know what they want and that you actually need to tell them what they want and things like that. So, so how do we, how do you push against that tie? Because it's not just, I think people are, are losing empathy. There's actually active mantras against it. Um, and so how do you how do you move against that? That's interesting. I think it's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I will say that when I started to use the word empathy and, and write about it in, in my book, one of the sentences I'm using is uh, immediately business people will think about crying kids and, and cupcakes because it's a pretty unusual term to use in um, in a business world. But then what quite often happens is that if you can get a CEO on board and see and feel things from a different point of view, they get it. And and I want to come back to to two answers to to what you just said now, Bruce. The first thing is Steve Jobs was also quoted saying that you always have to start from uh, the consumer or customer's point of view and works towards the technology rather than starting the technology and works backwards towards the customer. Um, so he did actually talk about empathy uh, in many ways. And, and behind the scene, for those of you guys who know Apple very well, uh, I certainly for sure know today that they use an enormous amount of time on studying consumer behavior uh, and consumer psychology. It's part of their DNA in there. Now, officially, they don't say that because they want to send this leadership attitude. Uh, but I think the truth is somewhat different. Um He's, he's one of the things which I've learned uh, work very well. Um, what I what I tend to do in organizations is, is uh, first of all, to understand the psychology of why is there such a resistance to change and also because of that to, to buy into empathy. And I think the best way to illustrate that is to take you back in time where there was an experiment done with chickens. Chickens were put into a cage. They're stuck in this cage for half a year. And one day they were let out on the beautiful green grass. And guess what? The chickens went straight out on the beautiful green grass. The sun was shining. And after 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And the chicken cage syndrome is really the idea of an immune system. It's a defense mechanism for chains because it's the fear of the unknown. And I do think uh, coming back to psychological safety is certainly one factor. But you also will notice you need to establish a sense of peer pressure within the organization to see the world in a different way. And if I should try to illustrate that going back to my little board here, if you guys imagine that we have four chicken cages all seen from the very top and they're all pointing towards the square and I'll be very nice to the chickens now so I'm going to open the gates here right when you talk to most business leaders today in order to make a transformation in an organization and make it more customer friendly and therefore also more suitable for for common sense where would you place the corn well most business leader would place the corn in the very center then you have the biggest chance to get the chickens out right But here's what's going to happen. Let's say we have chicken A. Chicken A is now looking at the corn. And my God, this corn is far away. And my KPIs are not supporting me going that far. And by the way, the chicken will think, that's pretty dangerous to go out there. What if my manager disappears and he's just being fired and I'll look like a stupid idiot? So what will chicken A do? Well, chicken A will most likely look at chicken B. And chicken B will kind of go through the same thinking process. So chicken B will choke like chicken C and chicken C and chicken D. And they will all conclude, my God, this is just not very smart to do. So they'll all go straight back in again into the cage. So how do you get chickens out of a cage? How do you do a transformation in an organization? Well, one of the things I've learned is instead of placing the corn in the very center, 
you actually should place it just outside the chicken cage. And what does that mean? It means you can grab the corn. It's an immediate gratification. That's what I call the 90-day interventions. And what happens is that you get a success story through which immediately can be celebrated and where the other you know, people here will start to say, my God, that was really successful over there. I want to try the same. And slowly you're building a transformation. So here's my advice to everyone trying to implement a sense of empathy in an organization. There's sort of three things you have to do. The first thing is you need to make business leaders feel the pain a customer is feeling. And, and the way you do that is to put them in the shoes of a customer. I did that the other day with a huge cruise liner ship in the, in the UK, which were for older people, people 75, 80, 89 years old. It was a, a, a very senior ship, and it was designed by people which were in the 30s. And, of course, it was ridiculous design. So instead of me trying to convince them, because I couldn't, I arranged that the whole board was standing there in the morning. It was a Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and I gave them all a space suit to wear. And, I, of course, they thought I was completely off my head. So they wore this space suit. They had aluminum in the feet. They had big, fat gloves, so they had very thick, you know, uh, glasses on. And then I had them all walk up the rank into this cruise ship and check in. And after two hours, they were just still standing in the lobby. One guy tried to walk <laughs> up the staircase. He couldn't. He was stuck halfway. A girl, she was standing in the elevator. She couldn't press the button because she couldn't see anything. They couldn't hear the messages. It was just horrible. And then I sat them down and said, this is how your audience really feel like. And this is how horrible your design is. And that was a sense of empathy. And that's what we did. We then said, what is the one thing we can change first? Was it going to have a profound impact on how you know, seniors feel on this cruise ship? We had a 90-day intervention implemented. And then once we had a success story going on, we celebrated that on the cruise ship and had every single staff behaving just like what I did with the senior management. And slowly we actually transformed this company to become very senior friendly. That's my message to you. It's all empathy. I'm not using the word. I'm making feel it instead, right? I love it. So, and I love the the idea that you're really focusing on small wins that are achievable. So you're looking at the the low hanging fruit, so that there can be some sort of win. And then winning and success is addicting. It's the the best kind of addiction to have. Yeah. yeah. So then it starts to snowball. Okay, I've done these little things, little things. Well, a lot of little things. Now I want to start tackling something more. Oh, you're doing that. I want to do that too. It becomes the sexy, the in, the in thing to do. So everybody wants to get on board. And now you have all of these high performers working together because you've just raised the bar. Yeah. Yeah. So and, you've and not that, only made it more usable, you have actually raised the bar. Absolutely. And, and, and one of the things I tend to do is to implement a, a change agent program. Now, change agent program has a bit of a tainted name, I think, these days. But the way we, we use it is very different. I tend to say, let's find the five believers in the organization which really were, yes, I love this project. This is absolutely amazing. We take them aside and we say to them, who are your best friends in this organization which always make something happen? We find five people for each of those five people. Now it's 25 people. And I say to them, make them do one small change which are going to remove a friction in their daily lives. Just one small change. And what we do is we slowly implement a small change one at a time. And this is really how the Ministry of Common Sense was born because we did that for a bank called Standard Charter Bank, which is the 10th largest bank in the world. And where this lovely lady at 2 a.m. in the workshop said, I'm sick and tired of all the nonsense going on in this organization. Let's install a minister of common sense. And we established this common sense set up. And we had all the staff submit all the stupidities. And believe me, there was a lot of them. But here's the amazing thing. There's two things which happened which were really crazy. The first thing which happened, and I think you said that just early on. The first thing that was happening is people felt subtly safe of saying and expressing their frustrations and the concerns and the fears in the organization because suddenly there was an interface allowing them to say things with a sense of safety net around them. The second thing was even worse or more crazy and, and positive here was for every concern and friction which was submitted to the ministry, they always attached a new solution. So we actually had thousands of solutions implemented and suddenly it became a self-fulfilling 
initiative going on, we really didn't have to do a lot except just to give people a mandate. And today, some three years later, thousands of common sense issues have been installed or reinstalled. And of course, NPS has gone up both for customers and internally. And it just happened with one small step at a time, just like uh, Gandhi, just like Martin Luther King, just like everyone else creating movements, right? Wow. So what are the changes that each of us are going to make tomorrow when we start our work day again, those of us who are actually going to the office or from home? I, you know, Hopefully everyone can start thinking about those small changes. And Marn, I know when we spoke several weeks ago about what's a great way to get started if you're not in a position of power, and you recommended start taking pictures. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, I want to say to all of you uh, on, on on this line that I don't think there's anything called going back to work. I call it going forward to work. And by mm-hmm. that, I mean, we are right now living in probably the biggest crisis in, in, in living memory. And we still tend to apply the bad habits from the good old days. We're still back to back in one Zoom call after another. We don't even have a break in between. We throw ourselves at the couch at 8 p.m. exhausted. And that's the moment where we have to start to do work now, right? We don't even go yeah. to toilets anymore. Toilet breaks up sort of magically, mysteriously disappeared out of our life. I don't know what happened, right? So here's what my message is. Just like you have a computer where you do a defragmentation, you're storing mem- memories in a different way to make it more efficiently, we need to defragment our life. And instead of us having to-do list, I would actually establish what I call an on-to-do list. It's a list where we start to remove duties. For example, saying, why should I be on a Zoom call nine times every day? In fact, I should carve out space where I'm thinking and reflecting instead. No, where we do things differently. So my advice to all of you guys would be to say, why don't you do an inventory check of your life? This is the moment for you to do it rather than reapplying the old stuff, which is broken in a world where most of the stuff we do is digitally, right? Martin, I am so impressed at at the brilliance and the the way you are articulating this brilliance when I know it is now 3 a.m. your time, (laughs) how you are... You don't want me giving a presentation at 3 a.m. You would get mush. So I am really <laughs> impressed and deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for your very encouraging word. You would absolutely make me bless this moment, three minutes to three o'clock in the morning, Swiss time. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thank as, you. And as Bruce, you're going to say something. As a physician, I, I have to say it's a good, a good idea to go to the toilet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bruce. I'm glad that you verify you know, one of my very, very scientific facts here. Yeah, I mean, I, that was a feature of medicine is that we were not allowed to eat or pee. And so uh, I have been alarmed by seeing that spread to the rest of the culture. Yes. And, you know, yeah. we, we've been giving out medical advice the last few weeks. We've had last week, we uh, last time we told people that they need to get more sleep. A couple of weeks before that, we were encouraging people to get colonoscopies. You never know what you're going to get on the optimizing your success show. Go to the toilet. <laughs> Go to the toilet, get sleep, get your colonoscopy. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. You're going to tell everyone where people can find out more about you. And again, a special thank you to Martin Lindstrom, who has been joining us in the middle of the night from Switzerland. He is the author of the amazing book, The Ministry of Common Sense, How to Eliminate Bureaucratic Red Tape, Bad Excuses, and Corporate BS. I have read this book. It is good. It is really good. And there are really examples in here that you can implement immediately. It doesn't matter what your rank is at the organization. So this is something to think about. So if you're like me and and you don't like the answer of we've always done it that way, their ideas here, how to overcome that. So now we are going to wrap up the Optimizing Your Success show. Everyone is going to tell you where you can find out more about them and their great work. I do want to remind everyone that these shows, the audio actually gets converted into a podcast. So if you have not yet subscribed to the Mentor Project podcast, Go ahead, subscribe. Please leave us a rating and review so people can find us. We actually read all of those and we get really excited when there's a new one. There's all these emails that go out. 
So thank you everyone again. Everyone tell us where we can find out more about you and your great work, starting with our medalist, Jack Scott. Awesome, thank you, Ruth. Martin, amazing. Uh, I'm gonna start applying more empathy and taking bathroom breaks starting tomorrow. So <laughs> those are the two things I'm gonna start doing right away. But the best way to find me is LinkedIn, just J A X. Scott, and I do want to say a shout out to our podcast at a manager that takes care of um, taking this this amazing recording and putting it over to a podcast. Kim Wynn, she's amazing. And then also Debbie behind the scenes. Yes, thank you. And uh, Jax makes us all, she keeps us in line. And Debbie Heiser, the CEO of the Mentor Project, is behind the scenes this week, making us all look gorgeous uh, and giving us feedback as to what we should do. She is our producer this week. So thank you. Janice Lintz. Hi, and thank you. Barton, I loved what you had to say. And I um, I want, I would love it if when you do the, the suits, if you could add to, for the cruise lines, um, hearing access, because I was on the passenger vessel committee and it's a huge, I think many people don't understand the sound systems as well, but yeah. I can be found at JaniceLintz.com and hearingaccess.com. Thank you. Dr. Allison Escalante. You can find me at AllisonEscalante.com or shouldstorm.com, uh, which links to all my stuff. And uh, for years, I've been trying to help parents understand their kids by describing their experience. This week, I'm going to make parents wear foggy glasses so they can imagine what it is to see as a newborn and get down on the floor so they can see all those big legs and table corners that their kids have to deal with. Great. Thank you. And I recommend that you go check out her articles in Forbes and Psychology Today. And if you have not yet seen her TED Talk, on the shit storm, go check that out as well. Now let's get to our two California girls, Jenna Marie Tutalman. Uh, I can be found on LinkedIn under Jenna Marie Tutalman. Beautiful, thank you. And our photographer with the amazing ability to see color in shades I never knew existed, Susie Katz. I hope you can hear me now. Sorry about the technical issues. Uh, you can find w the way I spend most of my time these days at photowings.org, P-H-O-T-O-W-I-N-G-S.org. And you can see some of my own work within a presentation I made on the Mentor Project at the one hour with a, uh, uh, with a mentor. You can find me there. And uh, some of my personal work is at SusanCatsPhotography.com. And everything we do is about communications, which is really a lot of the heart of what this conversation was. Love it. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Wiley. So impressive uh, presentation, um, Martin. Thanks for all the uh, the uh, suggestions. Um, I'm especially impressed by your ability to draw in the air. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to try to keep in mind who um, around me is chicken A, chicken B, and chicken P. Um, so you can reach me uh, by Googling Bruce Y. Lee. So the Y is important because uh, if you Google Bruce Lee, you'll get something different. I'm also at uh, Fury. BruceYLee.com. Uh, also, if you do Bruce Y. Lee uh, Forbes, you can um, see some of my articles. And Bruce is a prolific writer as well. And so definitely go check out his articles at Forbes, which come out about every 15 minutes. Martin Lindstrom, where can people find out more about you and your book? Well, first of all, thanks, everyone. You've been so amazing, Bruce. Thanks for your kind comment. Janice, I just want to say I did actually install earplugs in all the ears of all the senior folks so they couldn't hear a thing. No. And we did reinstall new speakers on the entire cruise ship, and not just on that ship, but on three other ships at the same time. So I'm so with you on this one. By the way, where can you find me? Very simple, martinlinstrom.com. Or, of course, you can just look in for look out for the Ministry of Common Sense, how to eliminate bureaucratic red tape, bad excuses, and corporate Bullshit. I'm going to say that full of word because I'm not allowed to say I'm that. I'm a lady. On. So I'm going to say that this is the bonus right. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for being up with us. Thank you. 
I am Dr. Ruth Gotian. I can be found at ruthgotian.com. You can also check out my Forbes and Psychology Today articles where I write about extreme high achievers and mentorship. There's actually an article coming out tomorrow teaching you about the two types of things that the mentors need to do. Obviously, all the social media, just my name, Ruth Gotian. Check out The Mentor Project. Check out the podcast as well. Thank you to Dr. Debbie Heiser behind the scenes. I got to everybody. Everyone said goodbye. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you next week where we will be joined by Olympic champion Ryan Millar, gold medal in volleyball. And he promised to show us the gold medal. See you guys next week. Bye. Thank you to all of our listeners and sponsors who've made this podcast possible. You can find out more about Dr. Ruth Gotian to optimize your success. Live events held every Monday at 8 p.m. EST by going to our Facebook page at The Mentor Project. I am Jack Scott, the Chief Operations Officer here at The Mentor Project and the host of Meet Your Mentor, which posts every Wednesday. If you're interested in working with The Mentor Project, please reach out to us by going through our website at mentorproject.org. We look forward to seeing you back here next week to learn more about how you can optimize your success.